Transformers Shattered Glass 2 is a continuation of the Shattered Glass storyline, set in an alternate universe where the roles of Autobots and Decepticons are reversed. The series focuses on the escalating conflict on Cybertron as both factions vie for control over the powerful Titan, Metroplex. Optimus Prime may have amassed an army, toppled the Senate, and bent Cybertron to his twisted will, but none of this would have been possible without Ultra Magnus, who sees himself as the true power behind the throne. Once a quiet bureaucrat, Magnus became increasingly emboldened by Orion's rise to power. His knack for exploiting loopholes in Cybertronian law enabled Orion and the Autobots to stretch the boundaries of due process, making him an indispensable ally. Despite Senator Shockwave's attempt to warn Magnus that Orion is merely using him, Magnus takes offense at the suggestion. When Bumblebee interrupts with a new query from Orion, Shockwave, realizing that Magnus is too far gone, silently exits. In the present, Ultra Magnus and the Wreckers arrive at Pax Gates, demanding an audience with Optimus Prime about recent developments. When Sunstreaker and World try to bar their entry, citing Autobot law, Magnus snaps that the law is whatever he says it is. Before the confrontation escalates, Optimus orders Sunstreaker to escort Magnus and one Wrecker, Jazz, to the throne room, leaving the rest of the team with a nervous whirl. As Orion's army grows, Magnus rises through the ranks until he's unexpectedly thrust into the spotlight when Orion appoints him as the public face of a new security unit tasked with maintaining order by any means necessary. Though Magnus initially objects, Orion reminds him that he's no longer the innocent bot he pretends to be and secretly enjoys finding ways to circumvent the law. As Prime brushes Magnus's face, he warns that the emotionless hologram Magnus uses to hide his true face might crack one day from stress. Magnus briefs a disinterested Optimus on recent events. The reactivation of Metroplex has ignited a race among the three Autobot warlords to control the Titan. While the fall of Gold City has given Megatron and the Decepticons a chance to regain a foothold and potentially reignite the war. When Jazz reminds Optimus that Magnus and the Wreckers helped him seize Gold City, Prime's temper flares and he strikes Jazz across the room. When Shockwave later crosses paths with Magnus' private unit and criticizes Magnus' promotion, the situation escalates. Magnus tries to calm things down, but when Cup makes a snide remark, Magnus snaps. His calm facade shatters, literally, as he drops his hologram to reveal his true face then takes down Impactor by viciously hurling Cup at him. Shockwave coldly questions whether Magnus truly wanted to stop the fight or if he was too afraid to admit he enjoyed the violence. When Wheeljack asks what they should do with Impactor, Magnus declares that it's time for real change. When Orion reprimands Magnus for dismissing Impactor and reorganizing the squad, Magnus reminds him that he's no longer the official leader. Magnus's new role includes the authority to remove uncooperative bots like Impactor from the newly formed Wreckers. Amused by Magnus's audacity, Orion decides to test him by involving him and the Wreckers in the next phase of his plan, a full-scale assault on the Senate. In the present, Magnus contemplates his role in the looming conflict. When Jazz sarcastically notes that Prime expects the Wreckers to fight Goldbug's Titan, Prowl's faction, and Megatron's Decepticons, Magnus decides it's time to reveal his true intentions. After leaving the fortress, on his command, the Wreckers spring into action, overwhelming the guards outside. As the Wreckers storm the building, Magnus confronts and captures Shockwave. Although Shockwave tries to remind Magnus of the good bot he once was, Magnus silences him with a single punch. Hoisting Shockwave's unconscious body over his shoulder, Magnus is confident that the brain-altering Imperata procedure will keep him quiet for good. Furious at Magnus's betrayal, Optimus confronts him. Enraged, Magnus roars that he won the war for Optimus before ramming him into his own throne. As Prime falls, the Wreckers watch as Magnus crushes his former leader underfoot, ready to implement the next phase of his plan. With Goldbug out of the picture, Megatron's Decepticons have taken over the remnants of Gold City, transforming the war-ravaged capital into New Kaon. On the outskirts of their new stronghold, Clench and Gutwrencher are busy clearing debris, unaware that Blaster and his mini cassettes are lurking in the shadows. With the area secured, Rewind shines a spotlight, setting the stage for Blaster's dramatic entrance, only to be interrupted by a very annoyed Slicer in Rodimus, demanding an explanation for his absence. 
As one of Ultra Magnus's deep cover agents, Blaster was forced into hiding. Though Rodimus accuses him of desertion, Slicer reminds him that they have a job for Blaster. Infiltrate Soundwave's radio station, download critical files, and disrupt the Decepticon communication network. As Blaster hurries off to prepare, Rodimus coldly remarks that failure is the one thing Wreckers won't tolerate. Blaster sends his remaining minions into action, slipping past Nuke Kaon's defenses and breaching the walls. As they pass Megatron and Jetfire, Blaster briefly uses his sonic abilities to stir up tension between the pair, remembering Eject's death at Megatron's hands. While he relishes the chance to watch them argue, Ramhorn reports that he's located Soundwave's radio signal. While Blaster's minions deal with any lingering Decepticon cassettes, Blaster himself breaks into the secure compound, bypassing Soundwave's shoddy voice-activated security and contacts Slicer to report his success. But before he can celebrate, Slicer informs him that he's already had to eliminate a pair of guards who witnessed Blaster's earlier sabotage. At that moment, Soundwave arrives, and a fierce battle of sonic waves ensues. Though Soundwave insists he doesn't want to fight, Blaster gains the upper hand. Ignoring Soundwave's warnings about the Decepticons mobilizing to free Cybertron from Autobot tyranny, just as Blaster prepares to deliver the final blow, an explosion forces him to retreat. Thinking quickly, he transforms into his alternate mode, and when Flame War investigates, Blaster's concussive sonics blow a hole in the wall and allow him to escape amidst the chaos. In the Badlands beyond New Kaon, Blaster reunites with his handlers, exhilarated by his narrow escape. But when they demand to know if he's destroyed the console before fleeing, Blaster admits he ran out of time. As he asks to see his boys, he realizes with horror that Rodimus and Slicer have killed all three of his remaining cassettes. Before Blaster can react, Rodimus smacks him in the face, declaring this as punishment for his failure to complete the mission and follow orders. Blaster tries to fight back, but Rodimus easily overpowers him. Staring down the barrel of Rodimus' gun, Blaster is told that he's nothing. Blaster flashes back to his original career as a news anchor at ABN. After a career-ending mistake, he became a supporter of Optimus Prime and returned to his musical roots. But a rivalry with his replacement Soundwave soon developed. An innocent offer to arrange an interview at one of Blaster's gigs pushed him over the edge, leading him to establish a pirate radio station to spread pro-Autobot propaganda. As the conflict escalated into war, Blaster and his minions found themselves on the front lines. Blaster may consider himself many things, but never a failure. Until Rodimus pulls the trigger. As Slicer begins salvaging what he can from Blaster's body, he orders Rodimus to drag the headless corpse back to the outskirts of New Kaon and make it appear as though the Decepticons found them. Rodimus agrees, but warns Slicer to find more competent operatives next time the Wreckers need help outside. Though Blaster failed in his mission, Slicer finds a use for him after all. His severed head makes an excellent makeshift radio, allowing Slicer to keep tabs on Decepticon communications. Following the fall of Gold City, Ratchet has been tirelessly rebuilding his clinic in a secure location. As Slicer hands him some fresh parts to tinker with, the irritable medic brings him up to speed on his hasty relocation. Meanwhile, the Wrecker Commando gears up for his next mission, convinced by Ultra Magnus's leadership that they're on the brink of a decisive victory. But the ever-gloomy Ratchet, skeptical as always, grunts that it's all the same to him, and cynically predicts that Slicer will likely lose an arm on this outing. Win or lose, Ratchet grumbles. He's the one stuck, quite literally, picking up the pieces. As Slicer transforms and races into the desolate static zone, he uses the advanced communications array embedded in Blaster's severed head to cut through the region's communications jamming radiation. Despite Soundwave's attempts at morale-boosting broadcasts, the pragmatic and pessimistic Slicer has no patience for them. Upon arriving at Metroplex's resting site, Slicer spots Jetfire scouting from above. Worse yet, the disturbed ground around the base of the buried Titan indicates movement. Slicer navigates the Titan's inner workings in search of Goldbug, using Blaster's head like a compass through empty corridors and deserted infrastructure, planting hidden explosives all along the way. Finally, he pinpoints the source of the radio interference. Goldbug has implanted Starscream's disembodied, indestructible spark into Metroplex's systems. When confronted by his old boss for going AWOL, Slicer lies, claiming he went underground after the fall of Gold City, and has only just resurfaced. The two work to get Metroplex moving, while Slicer discreetly tries to extract any useful information from the uncooperative Goldbug. Eventually, Slicer slips away to call in backup from the Wreckers, but just as he finishes, the ground trembles beneath him. Jetfire is making his move. 
and Metroplex is responding. However, when Jetfire weighs his odds and retreats, the Titan goes dormant again. Slicer tries to pry more information from Goldbug about Metroplex's erratic behavior, but the stubborn ex-tyrant won't cooperate. When Blaster's head picks up a garbled transmission from Soundwave about Decepticon activity on the front lines, Slicer gets an idea. Elsewhere in the wasteland, the Airstrike Patrol's recon mission takes a sudden turn when a shot from the ground obliterates Tailwind. Visper leads the remaining Decepticons in a retaliatory strike against Slicer and Goldbug, but the two Autobots quickly dispatch their attackers. Having provoked Goldbug into action, Slicer feels confident he can eliminate his former boss next, until Goldbug screams that he knows who Slicer is really working for. He tackles Slicer and aims a gun at his head, but before Goldbug can pull the trigger, Jetfire arrives unexpectedly, finally avenging Starscream by crushing Goldbug's head beneath his foot. The two traitors stand side by side for a moment until Jetfire turns his gun on Slicer, forced to deploy his last ditch trap. Slicer triggers the explosives rigged in his arm, severing the limb and stunning the ex Autobot. Jetfire, however, remains unfazed. Just as he prepares to finish Slicer, the other Wreckers arrive, lashing the Autobot Flyer to the ground with strong cables. Slicer yells that Ultra Magnus needs Jetfire alive to wake Metroplex, but they're not the only ones interested in the Titan. Flame War and her Decepticon crew are on the way. As the war between the evil Autobots and heroic Decepticons began, not all Cybertronians immediately chose sides. Cannonball and the pirate crew of the Rising Sea initially stayed out of the conflict, largely due to Cannonball's past disagreements with Megatron. However, during a somber drunken memorial for Cannonball at a rundown bar, Megatron approached Flamewar and her crew with a proposition, join the Decepticons, and help reclaim Cybertron from Autobot tyranny. Though Megatron believed Slipstream to be the leader of the pirates, the reality was that the crew followed Flamewar wherever she led. In the present day, Flame War grows increasingly frustrated, annoyed that Megatron hasn't given her the green light to engage the Autobots in the Static Zone. While Slipstream urges caution, Flame War, still seething from a recent encounter with Blaster, insists she's ready for action. The two argue over Megatron's true intentions until Shadow Striker finally cuts through the tension, questioning why they're still there if neither truly wants to be. Flame War, reflecting on Cannonball's legacy, admits that he would never have waited for the fight to come to him. With that, the crew of the Rising Sea transforms and speeds off to confront the Autobots. In a flashback, despite his disagreements with Megatron, there was a time when Cannonball and his crew joined Soundwave to defend Iacon's Titan Net from Windblade's deadly city crashers. Flame War, fiercely loyal to Cannonball, recklessly took on Rodimus alone ignoring her captain's warnings. This forced Cannonball to sacrifice his life so his crew could escape. Back in the present, the group arrives in the Static Zone, where they find Metroplex's frozen form, surrounded by Autobots, including Flame War's old nemesis, Rodimus. Flame War immediately declares her attention to kill Rodimus for everything he's done. Despite Slipstream's advice to be cautious, Flame War is determined to settle her score, even if it means going alone. As Slipstream watches her go, she quietly vows to always be by her side. As Flame War approaches Metroplex's base, Rodimus spots her and springs into action, leaving an irritated Slicer to haul their new prisoner, Jetfire, to Ratchet's base. The ensuing battle between Flame War and Rodimus is fierce, until an artillery shell from Hailstorm lands on the battlefield, sending both combatants flying. Hailstorm attempts to assist, but Rodimus shoots him, triggering a fatal explosion. Just then, Slipstream arrives to extract Flame War from the unwinnable fight. Grief-stricken over losing another comrade, Flame War breaks free and dives back into the fray, only to be knocked unconscious by Rodimus. In another flashback, Flame War was part of Megatron's ill-fated mission to Earth, and witnessed the final battle against the Autobots. Megatron ordered Starscream to evacuate the surviving Decepticons while he stayed behind. Although Starscream did his best to save as many as possible, the experience left Flame War with a harsh lesson, never leave anyone behind. Flame War regains consciousness inside Metroplex, shackled alongside a captured Optimus Prime, who is defiant as he's dragged away for an unknown procedure. Demanding answers, 
Flamore learns from Slicer that she's being kept alive as a bargaining chip. Just in time, Slipstream arrives to rescue her friend, and Flamewar, noticing Slicer's attachment to Blaster's severed head, seizes it and demands to know Ultra Magnus's plan for Optimus. Slicer reveals that Prime's body is crucial to Magnus's scheme, but when he lunges at Slipstream, Flamewar takes her shot, sending Slicer tumbling out of a shattered wall. As Flamewar reflects on her unexpected victory, she remembers Slipstream's words. She's most like Cannonball when she's focused and in the moment. With a promise to be by Flamewar's side, Slipstream helps her realize that revenge can wait. There's a much bigger fight ahead, and plenty of time to settle old scores. It's all-out war as Metroplex enters the fray, intensifying the battle between the Autobots and the Decepticons. As Soundwave struggles to transport his gravely wounded leader Megatron to safety, Megatron commands Soundwave to ignore him and focus on stopping Ultra Magnus. As Soundwave attempts to stabilize Megatron's injuries, the Decepticon leader discloses the gravity of the situation. Ultra Magnus has already captured Optimus Prime and coerced Ratchet into overseeing a sinister procedure that will help him assume Prime's identity. Soundwave's concern grows not only over Magnus commanding Metroplex, his own wreckers, and the loyalists deceived by this ruse, but also due to a deeper, more disturbing discovery. Through his heightened sensory abilities, Soundwave detects that Metroplex is not roaring in rage, but rather screaming in excruciating agony, and buried beneath that torment, he can hear the faint presence of Starscream. As Soundwave presses forward through the chaos, his sharp optics catch sight of Slicer, an Autobot trap and half crushed beneath one of Metroplex's colossal digits. Soundwave swiftly incapacitates the overconfident Springer, who had attempted to ambush him, knocking the Wrecker unconscious. Soundwave proceeds to free the immobilized Slicer, only to have the ungrateful Autobot immediately turn his blaster on his rescuer. Despite the imminent danger, Soundwave's telepathic abilities reveal a chaotic tangle of conflicting emotions within Slicer. As he tries to talk down Slicer, he lets slip that Megatron knows about Magnus' ultimate plan, and the true reason why the Decepticons are unable to control Metroplex. Just then, a revived Springer makes another desperate assault, but Slicer shoots him down, showing an unexpected empathy for Soundwave, and deciding to ally himself with Soundwave in an effort to bring down Ultra Magnus together, once and for all. The unlikely duo scale the massive hall of Metroplex, eventually reaching a ledge where Soundwave uses his voice disguising abilities to briefly mislead Jazz and Ricochet before incapacitating them. The two continue to make their way through the halls of the Titan until Soundwave stumbles upon a ghastly sight, Ultra Magnus's severed leg. Slicer speculates that Metroplex's erratic movements might have complicated the surgery, but they soon discover the grisly truth as they find the rest of Ultra Magnus's body. Now a mangled and hollowed shell with a disabled voice box, hosting Optimus Prime's consciousness. The real Ultra Magnus, in a shocking twist, is now wearing the stolen body of Optimus Prime. Despite the escalating danger, Soundwave maintains a calm facade, seeking to exploit the instability of Magnus, who is clearly struggling to adjust to the motor functions of his new unfamiliar body. Magnus, unaware that Slicer has switched sides, orders Slicer to execute Soundwave, as Soundwave telepathically scans Slicer's mind, he discovers Slicer's plan to eliminate the Wreckers, capture Ratchet, and escape. To make matters worse, Metroplex's and Starscream's mind patterns begin to converge. If they fully merge, Starscream's essence will be lost forever. Metroplex suddenly rears back, causing a massive shift that buries Magnus under a mountain of debris, providing Slicer and Soundwave with the opening they need to strike. In the ensuing chaos, Soundwave defeats Tailgate and Drift, while Ratchet takes a hit intended for Slicer. Soundwave, breaking his own vow, kills both Drift and Rodimus. After freeing Jetfire, Soundwave informs him of Starscream's need for assistance. They reach Metroplex's Spark Chamber, just in time to sever the connection that links Starscream to the Titan, which incapacitates Metroplex and allows Jetfire to retrieve Starscream's disembodied Spark. As Jetfire narrowly escapes through one of Metroplex's shattered eyes, Soundwave is left to confront Magnus alone, within the head of the falling Titan. Magnus attacks, but Soundwave scans his thoughts and discovers that Magnus's scheme stemmed from his own insecurity. Magnus had stolen Optimus's body not out of ambition, 
but because he doubted his own ability to lead the Autobots in his true form. Just as Magnus is about to strike Soundwave, a shot from below hits Magnus in the chest, causing him to fall from Metroplex's shattered eye. As Soundwave looks down, he sees Slicer and Ratchet below. By saving him, they've repaid their debt. As Metroplex crashes to the ground with a thunderous impact, Laserbeak swoops in to rescue Soundwave, lifting him to safety as the rest of the Decepticons converge to celebrate his victory. Elsewhere, Jetfire retreats to the static zone with Starscream Spark, while Slicer and an injured Ratchet recover in a nearby cavern. Optimus Prime, Goldbug, and Ultra Magnus might be gone, but there are still others out there who would do harm, and as long as Soundwave and the other Decepticons still stand, they'll never stop fighting for what's right. Well, there you have it, the conclusion to Shattered Glass 2. I had mentioned that I was hoping for this series to be a bit more action-packed, and this issue did not disappoint. I'm glad I finally got around to reading this series, and for those of you that haven't had the chance yet, I hope you've enjoyed following along. One of the reasons I started covering these comics was to make this story accessible to everyone that, like myself, just don't have the time to always read. You guys have been amazing, and I thank you all for your support while covering Shattered Glass 1 and 2. Let me know in the comments if you enjoyed this series. Don't forget to like this video and sub to the channel for more, and I'll see you guys next time.